Welcome to our introductory lecture on atomic nuclei. Now we've already seen that an atom is composed of two parts. They're negatively charged electrons orbiting a very small positively charged nucleus. The nucleus contains most of the mass of the atom. The electrons are less than one one thousandth of the mass of the entire atom. And the nucleus consists of two kinds of particles. There are protons, which are positively charged, with a charge plus E, exactly the opposite of a negative electron, and there are neutrons, which are uncharged. Together, these two kinds of particles are called nucleons. Now, in a neutral atom, there are the same number of protons in the nucleus as there are electrons orbiting the nucleus. Symbolically, we can represent a particular type of nucleus as follows. In the middle is the symbol, which is the chemical symbol for the element uh, whose atoms we're talking about. And then there are two numbers appended to the chemical symbol. The top number is the number A, which is the mass number, it's the total number of nucleons, the number of protons plus the number of neutrons in the nucleus. And then, as a subscript, we can append the atomic number, Z, which is the number of protons in the nucleus, and thus the positive charge of that nucleus. Of course, Z is a little bit redundant, because if we know the chemical symbol, then we know its atomic number. So sometimes, very often, we'll omit Z. So let's take a look at an example. Let's consider a very common nucleus, carbon-12. Carbon is chemical symbol C. There are 12 nucleons in the nucleus, of which six are protons, and the other six are neutrons. And we might write it this way, or if we uh, are sure to remember that carbon has an atomic number of six, we can write it this way, just carbon 12. Uh, carbon tells us that it has six protons. 12 tells us that the total number of nucleons is 12. Now this is not the only kind of carbon nucleus. There's another kind of carbon nucleus which has 13 nucleons, 6 protons plus 7 neutrons. And so we could write that this way, 13 carbon, carbon 13. And these two forms of carbon are uh, forms of the same element but they have different kinds of nuclei, different numbers of neutrons in their nuclei, and so these two kinds of the element are called isotopes of carbon. They're different isotopes of carbon. So isotopes are forms of a particular element with the same Z and different A. Because they have the same numbers of protons in the nucleus, they have the same number of electrons, and the electron configurations are almost exactly the same. The chemical properties of two isotopes of a given element are almost identical. Um, uh, so let's take a look at some isotopes of carbon. All of these have six protons in the nucleus, but you might have 11 or 12 or 13 or 14 nucleons in all. So five, six, seven, or eight neutrons. Now not all forms of carbon are stable. Um, carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable. This means that the, the nuclei, if left alone, will persist forever as far as we know. But carbon-11 and carbon-14 are unstable. Those nuclei undergo the process of radioactive decay, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so the rule of thumb we can, we can uh, uh, oppose here is that for a nucleus to be stable, if its Z, if its atomic number is fairly low, less than about 20, then the number of nucleons needs to be about twice the number of protons. That is to say, the number of neutrons and the number of protons needs to be roughly equal. Six protons and six neutrons, six protons and seven neutrons, that's stable. But if you have too many protons, or too many neutrons, or too few neutrons, the element will be unstable. But that rule of thumb changes once Z gets to be a higher number, higher than about 20, then the atomic number needs to be more 
or the mass number needs to be more than twice the atomic number, and uh, and that means that the uh, the number of neutrons needs to be more, perhaps substantially more than the number of protons for the nucleus to be stable. For very heavy nuclei, there are no stable isotopes, so the most the heaviest the the uh, um, uh, stable isotope is lead, which has an atomic number of 82. Things more uh, massive than this, things with more protons in the uh, nucleus than this, like uranium with 92 protons, are unstable. All of the isotopes are unstable. So let's talk about unstable nuclei. We're talking about the phenomenon of radioactivity which is the spontaneous transformation of an unstable nucleus into another type of nucleus. So typically what happens is some kind of nucleus, let's call it X, turns itself into another kind of nucleus, Y, and emits some stuff. Y is called the daughter nucleus, and there are different styles of radioactivity depending on what kind of stuff emerges. For example, there's alpha decay where the stuff that is emitted by the nucleus is a so-called alpha particle, essentially a helium-4 nucleus containing two neutrons and two protons. Another style of radioactive decay that other nuclei might undergo is beta decay. In beta decay, you emit or, as we'll see, possibly absorb an electron or a positron, an anti-electron, these are called beta particles, plus a neutrino. And finally, there's gamma decay, where all that happens is that the nucleus emits a high-energy photon. Now, typically, gamma decay occurs as the um, result of a previous decay. So what happens is that X decays to Y plus some stuff by alpha decay or beta decay, but the particular state of the nucleus, um, Y, the daughter nucleus, is an excited state. It's not in its ground quantum state. We'll denote that by Y star. And then Y star decays to Y by the emission of a photon, just as an atom in an excited state can decay toward its ground state. Okay, all three styles of radioactivity, all three styles of, of decay of unstable nuclei, um, follow the same basic mathematical law. And it works like this. Each decay of a um, radioactive nucleus is an independent random event. And that's crucial. So what happens if we have lots and lots of nuclei together? Well, we can see that in this, in this particular movie. On the, um, on the left-hand side, we have a bunch of atoms. On the right-hand side, we have a graph of the number of undecayed nuclei as a function of time. And what we see is that number decreases over time, not because there's any kind of systematic collective memory of what's going on, but because each nucleus decays at a time that's completely independent of other nuclei and completely random. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if we look at the rate of decay of, of a sample of, of, a, of an unstable isotope, the rate of decay will be proportional to the number of nuclei that remain, because each one decays independently of the others. And mathematically, we might write it this way, that the derivative of the number of nuclei that I have with, um, with respect to time is just a constant, a negative constant, times the number of nuclei at that particular time. And what is that constant? That constant lambda is the decay constant for this particular type of nucleus. And it's a constant. It doesn't depend on anything. It just depends on the type of nucleus. The fact that it doesn't depend on the number of nuclei present means that the nuclei decay independently of each other. And the fact that the decay constant is the same at all times means nuclei are memoryless. That a nucleus which has been around for a while is not, therefore, more likely to decay over the next second. All right. So how does this 
equation work out? What we're doing is we're solving a differential equation. And that differential equation is that the derivative of n with respect to time is minus the decay constant times n itself. And what we can do is we can rearrange this so that everything involving n is on one side and everything involving t is on the other side. And that looks like this. A differential of n over n is equal to minus lambda times the differential of time. Both sides can now be integrated. And when we integrate the, uh, the left side, we recognize that as being the natural logarithm. And the right side is just the decay constant times time. And of course, we have to add a, an integration constant to take into account the fact that these are indefinite integrals. OK, so the natural log of the number of particles is a constant minus the decay constant times time. And if we exponentiate both sides of the equation, we get an equation that looks like this. The number is equal to a constant, and this number is the initial number of particles, times e to the minus lambda t, the number of nuclei of an unstable element decreases exponentially over time. So the number of nuclei remaining in a sample of radioisotope decays exponentially uh, with this formula. The number is the original number times e to the minus lambda t, where lambda is the decay constant. And there's a different way to describe this, which is, uh, which is actually more common. And that is to introduce the concept of a half-life. When your time is equal to the half-life, then the number of nuclei is one-half of the original number of nuclei. And so looking at this equation, we can write down that one-half is equal to e to the minus lambda times a half-life. And by taking the logarithm of both sides of this, I get the following expression for the half-life, that the half-life of a radioactive element is equal to the natural log of 2 divided by lambda. The decay constant has units of inverse seconds, inverse time. And so the half-life will be a length of time, a certain number of seconds, or hours, or years. And the half-life is quite variable. There are long-lived isotopes with, uh, with half-lives that are thousands, or millions, or billions of years, and very short-lived isotopes where the half-life is a few seconds or less. It's often the case that we don't observe the number of nuclei of a particular isotope um, directly it's a lot easier to actually observe decay events because when a nucleus decays it emits particles alpha beta or gamma particles that we can detect with a geiger counter or or some other apparatus and so instead of n in the laboratory we usually observe the decay rate r and the decay rate is the number of decays per second and that of course is equal to the negative of the time derivative of the number of nuclei. And from our, uh, our previous analysis, we see that that's just lambda, the decay constant, times the total number of nuclei. And because the decay constant doesn't change with time, this means that the rate of decay, the so-called activity, the number of decays per second, um, decays exponentially with the same kind of law that n decays with, and that means that, that it's exponential and it has the same half-life as, um, as the total number of nuclei. As the uh, number of nuclei decreases, the activity, the number of decays per second, also decreases. Now, we could measure activity in, um, in number of decays per second. That would be fine. But we can also introduce a special traditional unit for activity, and that's the Curie. One Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10th decays per second. Now, that seems like uh, quite a large number, and it is. It's the approximate activity of one gram of radium. And 
Radium, of course, is a highly radioactive element that was discovered by Pierre and Marie Curie over a hundred years ago, and so the Curies have lent their name to the basic unit of radioactivity. All of this raises a kind of interesting question. If you look up in a table the half-life of uranium-238, you'll find that the half-life is 1.4 times 10 to the 17th seconds. That is, the half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. Now, how could such a half-life possibly be measured? It's certainly not the case that we've kept a sample of uranium in a laboratory for four and a half billion years and seen how the activity of that sample has changed over time. Um, every sample of uranium that we have has had essentially the same activity throughout historical time. We've only been looking at radioisotopes for only a hundred years or so. The way we measure the half-life of a very long-lived radioisotope is a little indirectly. It's because we can measure both the decay rate, the radioactivity, and the number of nuclei we have at any given time. So you'll recall that that activity was equal to lambda times n. And so if we measure the number of decays per second, and we measure the number of nuclei we have at a given moment, we can find lambda. Lambda is the rage ratio of r to n. And once we have the value of lambda, we can then determine the half-life in the usual way by taking um, the natural log of 2 and dividing it by lambda. And in this way we've measured some quite lengthy half-lives. The half-life of uranium, four and a half billion years, is by no means the longest half-life ever measured. Just a few years ago we found that the, um, the element bismuth, the isotope bismuth 209, um, which was previously believed to be stable, has a half-life that's about 2 times 10 to the 19th power years. That's 20 billion billion years. That's how long it would take for a sample of bismuth 209 to have half of its nuclei decay into something lighter. It's a, a, a remarkable measurement and a fairly recent discovery. So that's all for our beginning introduction to, to uh, nuclear physics. We'll talk much more about in class about uh, the different styles of radioactivity and about the crucial role of, of mass and energy in determining how uh, nuclei behave and how radioactivity proceeds. So, I'll see you in class.